Tal Heinrich is an Israeli journalist and news anchor based in New York. She reports and provides analysis on U.S. politics and foreign affairs for Israel's Channel 14 and writes about the Middle East for All Israel News. She previously anchored the daily primetime show Crossroads on I-24 News from Times Square and covered the United Nations as a correspondent. Back in Israel, she produced for CNN International from the network's Jerusalem Bureau and contributed content during the 2014 war between Israel and Gaza, the 2015 re-election of Bibi Netanyahu, and the terror wave known as the Knife Antifada. In 2013, Tal worked as par parliamentary assistant at the German Bundestag as part of its flagship international fellowship program. She is fluent in English, Hebrew, Arabic, and German. She holds a BA in Arabic Literature and History and a Master's Degree in Contemporary Middle Eastern Studies. It is my sincere pleasure and honor to introduce Tal Heinrich. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very moving. Okay. Hello. Good morning, everyone. I think I, I will hold the microphone. I am very, very happy to be here today. According to our original schedule, this conversation with you was supposed to take place something like two years ago, but then COVID happened and life stopped. And I just appreciate and am so happy for every opportunity that I have to come to Florida, especially since I come from New York. And <laughs> Although we are going to focus on the Middle East in this debrief of recent developments, I want to start this conversation by talking a bit about what's happening in Eastern Europe between Ukraine and Russia and take it from there how this crisis is influencing Middle Eastern countries and what is the message that Iran has been getting from the Western response to Putin's aggression, all while a nuclear deal is being negotiated. Because you see, all these things are intertwined. One is affecting another, and that is what I want to focus the conversation on. And of course, what we can expect to see next once the pending deal is signed with Iran. What's at stake? And I do promise, I promise Brian and I promise Lauren, that I will finish this uh, debrief on a very positive note because this is what I like to do if only relationships were the same <laughs> okay um, so as, as you can imagine probably and I guess you are all quite familiar in following events in the region there is no united approach of Middle Eastern countries to what's happening with uh, Russia's aggression in Ukraine Every Middle Eastern country has its own internal interests and in a very obvious way, it's influencing the way it's been uh, reacting. So the reaction has been different across the Arab world, uh, different in Israel and Turkey. Israel and Turkey, by the way, are two countries that have been trying to mediate the crisis to no success so far. Maybe Turkey has been a bit more successful than Israel in its attempts, um, or Iran, for example. Um, so, so far, <laughs> We've seen different reactions, and I'll start with Israel, because uh, we all, that's the country we, all of us uh, mostly care about here. And if you've been following, then Israel moved from uh, expressing a somewhat very contained, soft, neutral approach at the beginning of the invasion in, uh, in, in, uh, of Ukraine to expressing support to Ukraine, and then even eventually condemning Russia at the UN General Assembly. And then the mediation attempt of Prime Minister Naftali Bennett uh, started between the two sides. So there was a gradual shift, uh, not to say that Israel did not support, you know, uh, didn't condemn the violence from the very beginning, but there was a shift in what the Israeli government said publicly. Uh, for many, for, for ma mainly two reasons here. Uh, first, Israel is walking a very thin line with Russia because Russia de facto controls the territory of, of Syria. is is the the, the you know the most uh, powerful force to be reckoned with on Syrian territory, and Israel 
over the last years have has been coordinating attacks on um, against Iranian targets in Syria with Russian forces. So that is one thing to keep in mind. Israel sort of has a border with Russia. We can we can say it this way, and they've been cooperating there. And the second reason is not a reason that I should explain to this particular audience because, you know, we have Jews in Russia and in Ukraine. So it's, it's an obvious interest of, of Israel to walk this uh, thin line. And the, what is interesting, though, is the public debate in Israel over the government's reaction uh, to the crisis. And it has taken shape in two major forms that I think would interest you. One is the concerning the mediation attempt that Naftali Bennett, he, if, if you've been following, he went to Moscow at some point. It was, what, three weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago. He met with President Putin. He's been holding back-to-back -back phone calls with Zelensky and with Putin. Zelensky spoke um, to the Israeli Knesset via a, a video link. Um, so there's that. And the Israeli public discourse has been very interesting because on one hand, you have people saying every attempt to mediate this crisis and bring to the end of it is just a blessing, uh, no matter what the result would be. And on the other hand, you have Israelis saying, well, it is more likely that he will fail. It's, it's more like a lose-lose situation because succeed, succeeding is, I mean, it's, it's very, very um, difficult. And what would be the impact of is on Israel if Bennett fails in these attempts to mediate? Um, and some said that maybe he's been being used as a pawn, uh, maybe by the White House, carrying the message that the United States messages that the United States maybe cannot say upfront travel to Moscow, for example, in the middle of the crisis. Um, so some Israelis claim that might benefit Naftali Bennett on the personal level, on the political level, on the, you know, getting him a world name, um, but might not be as good when it comes to the interests of the state of Israel. So that is one sort of public debate. The second public debate that has been concerning has been brewing and you see it playing out you know in cafe conversations you see it playing out um, on the media and whatnot and in parliament was over israel's responsibility to absorb refugees from ukraine so, and, and the debate has been uh revolving around the priority of uh bringing in Jewish refugees or their families. So, but I would say that the, the consensus on this issue has been a bit larger more than on the mediation one that I mentioned. Um, I want to talk a bit about the Arab reaction to what's happening in Ukraine because once we have this background in mind, it would be easier for me to, under, to, to take you to what's happening with Iran now. So the Arab League, which is a 22-member state body that is based in Cairo, convened an emergency session very early on when the crisis um, erupted, just like the UN Security Council and UN General Assembly convened. And at the end of their emergency session, there was a very, very vague statement that they issued that said nothing, like we denounced the violence, but we do not mention Russia explicitly, which tells you that the Middle East, Middle Eastern countries, Arab countries, differ so much in their reaction. On one hand, you have countries like Syria and Iran that support Russia, and on the other hand, you have a country like Lebanon that condemned Russia very early on, and I would even dare to say, before Israel spoke out. And that was really remarkable. Um, I will start with Syria because we already touched on Syria and uh, say that, well, the Assad regime has been supported by the Russians for at least seven years. They are militarily on the ground. Um, so there is, it's a no-brainer for the Assad regime. Of course, we stand with Russia, we support Russia. And uh, something interesting to keep in mind is that Russia, of course, it's the reason why Assad is still in power. They've been giving him the lifeline as he murdered almost half a million of his people over the years, according to uh, the estimations. Um, what some Middle East experts say, and that is um, interesting, 
is that Russia made certain calculations before it invaded Ukraine based on their experience with Assad in Syria. Meaning that um, Assad has been doing what he's been doing for years. He's still doing that. Uh, we saw that he prevailed despite of global condemnation, boycott, heavy sanctions, and yet he's still there. And now gradually we see that countries in the region, like Egypt, like the UAE, like Ar Algeria, for example, and others, suddenly they've, that's it, they're receiving him. He stayed. He, he's, he's still in power, so they are renewing diplomatic ties with him, which is pretty remarkable because he was a pariah, even in the Arab world, um, for a while. So Russia was watching it, and that's what some experts that I've been following have been saying, and, and sort of made their calculations also based on, on that experience with him. Um, Iran is the second Middle Eastern country that really, country that really showed support uh, to Russia, but I should differentiate it here and say probably the Middle Eastern regime and not the people because the people of Iran really, really hate Russia. And then you have the regime where the foreign minister of Iran um, said that the, the entire war, the crisis is rooted in NATO provocations. Nothing to do with Russia here. It's NATO's fault. And Iranian state media, for example, has been using this terminology, the Ukraine crisis, not the Russian invasion of Ukraine, how we say it here, uh, how it's reported in Israel, for example, but the Ukraine crisis, that's how they, they call it. And on the other hand, you have a country like Lebanon that very early on issued such a strong condemnation of Russia, um, called to stop all operations, to halt the violence, and then on uh, the Facebook page of the Russian embassy in Beirut, uh, something pretty amazing happened. They, they posted um, a statement saying, we are surprised. We are surprised by this reaction that you're taking sides, um, something like that. The, uh, surprised that you're violating the policy of self-distancing and by taking one side against another in these events, noting that Russia spared no effort in contributing to the advancement and stability of the Lebanese Republic. And then you have other countries that are sitting, either sitting on the fence, like uh, the kingdoms of Jordan, Bahrain, Oman, or leaning a bit more towards one side or another based on their internal interests. Qatar, Kuwait, but, but here in particular, I'm going to talk a bit just about Saudi Arabia, um, the United Arab Emirates and, and Egypt, because they are countries that signed arms deals with, with Russia. So of course they have very obviously different interests in mind. And um, one interesting thing that took place was when the United States convened the UN Security Council very early on, and even before the UN General Assembly was convened, uh, the, UN, the US UN ambassador tried to pass a resolution to condemn Russia. The United Arab Emirates abstained on that vote. They were members, non-permanent members of the UN Security Council. And that was interesting because some reports in the Middle East and in Israel claimed that they abstained, they did not support the, Uni the United States in this action because it was uh, a sort of a protest saying that the White House is not strongly enough coming out against attacks on their territory that Iranian-backed proxies have been carrying out for months now. Just keep that in mind, all of this, because when we get to, uh, to speak about Iran, Saudi, we, we will have this information, we will need this information in mind. Um, and just uh, briefly here, <coughs> excuse me, the water please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the, the way, so we talked about the reaction of, of certain uh, countries to the war in, in Ukraine, but now I want to just briefly mention the impact on their economies. In the Middle East, it, it, it's also, it, it hasn't been coherent because you have poor countries that are really badly affected by, you know, the soaring prices of energy, soaring prices of wheat. I have an interesting data that I copied here. Did you know that Ukraine was forecast to account for 12% of global wheat exports? Now, along with Russia, 
which is the top wheat exporter apparently in, in the world, they both account for roughly 29% of global wheat export. And, and you can imagine that countries in the Middle East, and namely Egypt, Tunisia, Morocco, Syria, are countries that are directly affected by it. In Syria, even the Assad regime uh, announced that they're going to cut off certain spending to try to balance you know, the impact. Um, so that is one thing. And on the other hand, you have oil-rich countries in the Middle East recognizing a great opportunity for them. They, they want to become alternate gas exporters and sort of uh, replace you know, the supply that was of natural gas and oil that was um, coming to uh, European countries from Russia. Uh, Qatar is, is one example. They already tried to push with Germany. Germany has 55% of their natural get head, I should say, came from uh, Russia. So Qatar has been pushing to try to, feel, uh, to, to fill this uh, void. Um, Italy is the second, is the second um, largest uh, importer of, of natural gas from Russia, 45%. And they just signed a new deal with Algeria, for example, to receive uh, uh, natural gas from them. Libya offered their resources as well. It's not off, you know, I'm saying offer, just take it, but they, they, they want to uh, capitalize on the opportunity and, and gain some profits. And, um, and then you have Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates that are often discussed in the US media here if you've been following because the Biden administration has been trying to make certain overtures towards these countries to make them pump more oil in order to ease supply. And if you've been following, uh, they, there have been certain reports saying that they did not even pick up the phone call. They were angry. And why are they angry, Saudi Arabia and the UAE? Because for many months, and more, more recently, even in, in the recent uh, period, a few weeks ago, there, has, there have been constant attacks on their territory, if it's Riyadh or Abu Dhabi or other places, um, from Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen. And um, what they're saying is, first, that the White House response hasn't been um, the harsh enough, that they're not doing enough, and not only that it wasn't strong enough, a nuclear deal is also being negotiated with Iran, which will give them millions of dollars, and, and you, we all know where the money goes. The money goes to these ballistic missile programs, and these missiles are being fired at different um, locations. So, um, yeah, and if, if you remember when uh, Biden was a candidate um, for presidency, he was very, very much, uh, he took a very hardline stance against the Saudis. He even referred to them as a pariah in one of the Democratic um, debates in, 20, in 2019, I don't, in, uh, yeah, in 2019, I think it was. One of the early debates, he, he said that he's going to take a very hardline approach towards the Saudi regime, uh, you know, Biden's uh, approach towards the Saudis. And suddenly, given what we're seeing in, in Russia and the oil prices soaring, uh, the administration has been making all these overtures towards, you know, Saudi Arabia, suddenly in Venezuela, suddenly even Iran has been getting more than we could have ever imagined, according to the reports. Um, because of what's happening. Yep, well, uh, some would say it's, it's, it's whitewashing at its very best, suddenly the, the, the change of approach. So here's why we're here. <laughs> Enough with background. Um, what is the message that Iran has been getting from all of this? From, as, as, as you know, um, what the West says, what the West does, and by the West, of course, uh, the leader of the West, the, the United States, against Putin also resonates in Tehran. They have been taking notes. All the bad players have been taking notes from what's unfolding and how it unfolded. And, and what do the Iranians see? The first thing that they see, in my opinion, and I would love to hear yours when we get to the q and A. I I will leave time for it at the end, is that Western leaders, the current ones that 
we have, they only act very, very tough after the red lines are being crossed. And, well, crossing a border, invading into a foreign sovereign state is one sort of a red line, but what about a red button, a red nuclear button? What is the, the point of being very, very tough after nukes are produced or, God forbid, activated? That's one thing to keep in mind, one conclusion that the Ayatollahs are drawing. The second thing that they saw is that the United States and its European allies did not stop for a moment with the negotiations that started in Vienna a long time ago. And given Putin's invasion, try to, maybe we should reroute. We should think where we ha we're heading because there's this crazy dictator in Europe and, and here's what he's doing. And we know that there, we're just talking with another crazy dictatorship and maybe we should draw some, something from it. Maybe we should rethink the path that we've been heading or trying to dictate a different tone. Um, and not only that the West didn't do it, and by the West I mean world powers and the United States that have been negotiating with Iran the new nuclear deal, they accelerated the talks in Vienna. They want to wrap up. And why do they want to wrap up? I mean, it also has its own, own logics. First, because when you think about the US administration, they want and they need to show some achievement on the foreign front after Afghanistan and with whatever's happening in Europe now and just be sure that no matter what is going to be signed in Vienna um, probably we don't know yet um, will be presented to us as an amazing diplomatic achievement that should be celebrated so brace yourselves <laughs> um, yeah that is why one one reason probably and the second reason is also very obvious it's it's, it's the economy um, Europe, and I'm afraid to say even the, the, the U.S. administration are recognizing that Iran may be part of the solution. Maybe they're not, uh, maybe they're part of the solution to what's happening in Europe in terms of oil and, you know, natural gas and so on. Maybe it's not so much part of the problem. So if we do that, if we have this opening, maybe things can get better to many European country, countries. Because if you remember, after a 2015 deal was signed, um, it came with a lot of, you know, business b between European countries and Iran and whatnot before Trump stopped it, um, withdrew and, and, and imposed the sanctions. And I have a quote here. Um, I have some quotes that I highlighted because I, I, we chose not to do it with a presentation. So I, I just want to read you something that maybe went a bit unnoticed in the media. Just a few weeks ago, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg was asked by MSNBC. This is the question. Could the president possibly consider authorizing the Keystone Pipeline working something out with Iran? And Buttigieg replied, quote, the president has said that all options are all on the table, but we also need to make sure that we're not galloping after permanent solutions to immediate short-term problems. All options are on the table. I mean, working something out with Iran all options are on the table. I mean, that, that's what he said. It's his words. It's not mine. And meanwhile, another thing that Iran has been, has been doing is to take advantage of, of the shift in global attention to end the ongoing negotiations to do what, what they want to do, uh, which is to test weapons, to better their weapons. Um, they solidified their uh, unmanned and satellite technology. They launched a new satellite into space, which is usually it's, it's not their space program that we're worried about. We're worried about the fact that once, once you launch a rocket to space, you actually test um, the, the, the same, a similar system that will be used when, when you launch the nukes, once you have the, they have the nukes. Um, and they fired missiles on uh, territories in Saudi Arabia in the United Arab Emirates, in Erbil, in Iraq, just the latest one, the very unprecedented attack with missiles that were fired towards the compound where uh, the American consulate there is located. So you have all of it. But you have another 
interesting development from the White House that just this Thursday, I don't know if you saw, uh, the White House, uh, rather the Treasury Department announced new sanctions against Iran's ballistic missile program. And that is very significant. And it's interesting that it's happening now um, when a nuclear deal is reportedly pending, almost imminent, I would say. Um, and also as they are trying to appeal more to the Saudis, to the Emiratis to pump more oil. So that is another conclusion that the Iranians have in mind. And uh, this is the time to test weapons, like now we can do it. They're looking at Putin. And the most concerning conclusion that Iran is taking from what's happening in Europe is we should not give up our nuclear aspirations. And here, I mean, look what happened to Ukraine, they say. They, they, they gave up their nukes in 1994. Look what happened to Gaddafi, by the way, how he ended up. We shouldn't do it. We should not give up these aspirations. And there was an interesting, I saw a very interesting video, a tweet of the Ukrainian ambassador to the United Kingdom that was interviewed by some Iranian outlet and um, a very conserv conservative editor of a newspaper in Iran shared this video. And um, I will read to you what he said. Again, the Ukrainian ambassador to the UK speaking to an Iranian outlet. Quote, we had two times more nuclear arsenal than France, Great Britain and China together. We exchanged it for the promise of help. It's not just that help is not coming, but also one of those who signed this agreement, Russia, is now threatening us. This is a great lesson for us, but it is a, also a great lesson for nations who are threshold nations like North Korea and Iran, who are trying to defend themselves, building up their nuclear shield. So this is one message that they have been resonating there, right? Um, Iran's recent actions and their flexing of their muscles in the negotiations in Vienna, in my opinion, it's quite an evidence to the very squeezable position of, of the West, the failure of Western nations to create a deterrence against what Putin did and do it on time and recognize the threat, it's something that resonates um, in Tehran and, and so does the failure to protect Ukraine. Um, and, and the fact is that a new nuclear deal with Iran would repeat past mistakes, not only the past mistakes of the first deal from 2015, but also the mistake of not containing, not recognizing, not reacting um, against Putin when it was important to do. So um, it's from what is shaping up to be, it seems like it's shaping up to be like a missed opportunity to take advantage of what Putin has done and how we reacted to him and implement it also against the next big threat. Um, and the question is, what can we really expect to see from this new upcoming deal? Because we don't know much. Um, we only started um, getting exposed to what's happening in the negotiations um, really recently when uh, there was a former State Department official. He, his name is Gabriel Norona, and he tweeted a very viral uh, thread on Twitter with what he said was what his former colleagues told him. He worked under the Trump administration. He was fired later by, by Trump in late uh, 2021. So, um, so you can't say that he's very much one way or another leaning, you know, he was fired by Trump, but then yet he supported his um, actions specifically on, on the Iran deal. And this guy wrote, my former career State Department, NSC and EU colleagues are so concerned with concessions that are being made by Robert Malley in Vienna. Robert Malley is the US top negotiator um, on Iran from the Biden administration, that they have allowed me to publish some details of the coming deal in the hopes that Congress will act to stop the capitulation. Uh, and then he published uh, some things. I'm not going to read everything to you, but I'm just going to give you the, the headline. He says, this is a long and technical thread, but here's what you need to know. 
The deal being negotiated in Vienna is dangerous to our national security. It is illegal, it is illegitimate, and it in no way serves U.S. interests in either the short or long term. So from what we know about what's in the deal, um, first is that it's, I mean, it was promised that it will be a, a, you know, a longer and stronger deal, but we're learning that it's not longer and it's not stronger. Um, he says the apparent new deal is shorter and weaker than the previous one. In, when the deal, the Obama negotiated deal was signed in 2015, um, it was signed for 10 years, which means that in two and a half years, um, all the main restrictions on Iran's uranium enrichment will just poof, expire. Um, Naftali Bennett, the Israeli Prime Minister, said Iran will be able and entitled to develop and install advanced centrifuges without restrictions, stadiums full of centrifuges, according to the new agreement. And I assume that Naftali Bennett has better sources than my Twitter feed. Um, so, so if he says it, um, they probably know it. There is going to be what, what looks like uh, a, a very far-reaching sanctions removal, even more far-reaching than what we saw in 2015. The United States apparently has already agreed to uh, you know, lift restrictions that are not directly related to the nuclear program, which means restrictions on Iran's central bank, national development fund, the regime's economic and financial arms, sanctions on dozens of, Ira dozens of Iranian individuals and entities who were directly involved in terror activities, also against um, Americans, um, not only across the Middle East. And there has been um, this issue that's uh, being taken being discussed in many headlines now of the designation of the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, as a terror organization. So apparently this is also being discussed. It is one of the demands that Iran has been making. Uh, Trump added them to the list of uh, terror organizations and now it's being discussed that they their name will be removed from there, which is, it may be a bit sy symbolic, but it's quite a symbol, you know, um, in terms of its implications. Of course, the deal will also limit the percentage of to which Iran can enrich uranium and the uh, amount of enriched uranium it can hold. But as we already learned, um, it, it, it's pretty pointless because it, it, they can very quickly get back at it. Um, they they proved it already, so. And another outrageous aspect of it is that Russia will be able to deal trades, do whatnot with Iran. Um, and the main concern is that, that Russia will be able to circumvent some of the Western sanctions through their dealing with Iran. Um, thanks to this deal that it will be made possible now. Um, the Russian foreign minister some, said something super concerning. He said that under the deal, Russia and China would be allowed to help Iran develop civilian nuclear programs. Okay, all right, civilian. Well, why are you moving in your chairs uncomfortably? It's, it's all civilian. <laughs> okay, so what is being left out? Apparently, uh, the fact that Iran should be restricted and never, ever, ever, ever get a bomb. Um, the ballistic missile program is being left out. The, um, you know, the regional destabilizing activities, whatever they're doing across the region is being left out. And the spirit of the deal, which is the, the term that the Trump administration has coined when they pulled out of the deal in 2018, um, I think that in 2022, there is no illusion. Nobody thinks that there is any spirit to the deal. Um, maybe in 2015, the Obama administration and, and Angela Merkel and, and who not had some hopes. It wasn't a clause there, of course, but it was. But there was a feeling that maybe if we do that, then Iran will start acting a bit more like a normal country because they will see all the financial opportunities that it brings and that they're a bit more legitimized on um, the international level and so on. Um, but now in 2022, there's, there's no spirit of the deal. I mean, we, masks are off, right? <laughs> Everyone knows that. Um, and what will be the implications 
of if, if, if this deal is really going to be signed. I want to um, move on quickly. I just want to remind you that after the deal was signed in 2015, and these are some data that I showed uh, in my previous presentation that Lauren attended with the FIDF of what, three years ago, and it's still relevant now because it's something that we have to keep in mind. After the 2015 deal was signed, listen, the Iran's oil production went up 22%, reaching more than 4.5 million barrels a day. Their income grew extraordinarily, 12.5 five percent and just imagine with everything happening with russia how much more this can be now you know um if you, with the oil and and everyone is looking for other partners to do trade and and, and business with um and uh brian where did the money go to the money that um that's <laughs> that's just the exactly where it always goes um it went to fun terror Yes, um, some numbers from the State Department. Uh, Iran gave $700 million to Hezbollah annually before President Trump withdrew from the deal. Approximately $100 million a year to Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza. Between 2012 and 2018, $4.6 billion to the Assad regime overall. So the question is if this pending deal is so bad, why don't we hear more from the Israeli government against it? Why aren't they now not really speaking out publicly loud against this deal? Naftali Bennett said um, just last week that the U.S. is going to sign a deal with Iran no matter what. And for that reason, um, he says the Biden administration is simply fully determined to sign a something. And he said that he therefore has no intention to create a public, public rift with Washington if the deal is going to be signed. And let me quote him. He said, we pick, we pick our battles. I'm very annoying with the microphone. I'm sorry. We, every time I, I say P, okay. We, I'm afraid to say it softly. We, <laughs> we pick our battles huh, with the Americans. There's no reason for an international campaign against the nuclear deal because it will be signed. Bennett reportedly told cabinet ministers, I think it was last Sunday, we will fight only where there's a real purpose. And in the case of the IRGC, the designation of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, which is still we're trying to stop because they recognize that there maybe there's an opening to influence, but either way a deal is going to be signed. So why should we fight with the White House? And then, um, but on the IRGC issue, Bennett and also Foreign Minister Yair Lapid have been very outspoken. They issued a, a very strong statement saying, we refuse to believe that the United States would remove the designation um, of the IRGC as a terrorist organization. So, as you can imagine, again, going back to the public debate in Israel, uh, many Israelis compared this response with, you know, what Benjamin Netanyahu did back in the day, which was to speak on every uh, global stage in Congress, United Nations, why not, uh, ag against the, the, the nuclear deal. Some Israelis, by the way, even suggested it's a, it's a bit of a conspiracy theory, but it's interesting to, to bring it up because it's being discussed uh, all the time that the IRGC designation could be some, um, you know, uh, an, an issue that is not so real and maybe like a coordinated move between the Israeli government and the United States that, okay, it's, maybe we will give the Israeli government victory on that issue and keep them on the terror list eventually and then the Israeli government will be able to show that they made some diplomatic achievement although uh, a nuclear deal was signed. I don't know if it's true because the IRGC is a real serious issue but that's just one of the voices that I've been hearing from Israel so I'm telling you the story. So why was Israel silent? Uh, first, of course, as Bennett said, because he sees to no avail, why would I fight with Washington? But also, if, if you remember, uh, Naftali Bennett, he promised President Biden when he came to Washington, I don't know, well, uh, half a year ago, something like that. I'm looking for your validation every time with my time. Um, he, he promised um, Biden that he will not take the BB Netanyahu strategy and that his government will keep a backdoor uh, diplomatic channel of quiet diplomacy to achieve goals. Um, one of the things is probably that Israel, the Israeli government said, we will tamp down 
public criticism of the deal, of the negotiations in Vienna, in order to be able to receive information from the White House, if we choose to do it, about what's really going on there. They will keep us informed if we will play nice and polite. That's, what, that's one assumption. We don't want to be cut out and not you know, be fully involved. Not that they're fully involved, but at least be informed, I should say. Um, yeah, another, another um, yeah, well, it makes sense. So uh, Netanyahu, on the other hand, he just gave a big interview, I think it was like a week ago, <coughs> and he really came out, he gave an interview to Mark Levin in the, the US, I think, like two weeks ago, and he gave a big interview in Israel a week ago about, like he spoke for 15 minutes about the Israeli government's response to what's happening with um, negotiations with Iran. And he said, well, even if a deal is going to be signed, there's still a lot of value and benefit from speaking out very, very strongly against it because how can you give you know, support to your supporters in the United States? For they say, the he said, let me translate from Hebrew. He said, the Israeli government is trying to be more Catholic than the Pope. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it worked in English too. Uh, so they're trying to be to appear more Catholic than the Pope. If you are not making your case against it, how do you want Israel's supporters in Congress to make the case for you against the Iran deal? So he said, there is a, uh, it, it, we must speak out against it. We shouldn't be silent. And um, another reason is that he said, you should remember, and that brings us to the fun part of this presentation. I'll conclude the, the bad stuff with this. Netanyahu said that when he spoke out against Iran very harshly on the international uh, level, uh, international stages, it eventually showed potential, then potential U uh, um, U.S., I'm saying, Israel allies in, in the region that they have a partner. So this signaled to Saudi Arabia and signaled to Bahrain and to, to the UAE, and then we had the Abraham Accord. So and the Middle East is changing. And here I will give me 10 minutes, seven minutes, and then we'll, we'll get to, um, to uh, questions or comments that you have. It's been amazing. It has been amazing since the Abraham Accords were signed. And there is no way to overstate it. It's just such a big change in the region. I mean, guys, the Israeli-Arab conflict is over, simply over, the moment the Abraham Accords were signed. And I will try to describe that to you because there are so many developments happening every day in every field that it just, it fills your heart with expectation and, 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 and joy and this is just the beginning. It's really mind boggling um, because first you had the deal but now you see that substance is coming and substance is happening in every field. And you know what? And before we'll talk to you about certain agreements and, and trade deals, that I'll just mention to you that you will have it in mind about the change that's happening in, in our region, is the people-to-people -people relation. When they signed the deal, the, the, the peace treaties, and it said, you know, it has this clause, we, we very much hope that, you know, we'll, it will promote people-to-people -people relations. Nobody had in mind what is, uh, what is happening now. I can tell you that almost every Israeli that I know from Tel Aviv has a, an Emirati or a Bahraini friend, a, a friend or a, a business colleague, some, someone who reached out to them to explore. Or even in New York, I, I have a friend who moved, is actually two friends, who moved to the UAE, moved to live in, in um, Dubai or Abu Dhabi and um, they're doing business there, they're working there. And whenever someone, like a friend of a friend comes to town in New York, I'm getting a phone call, Michal tells me, hi, can you meet up with my friend, um, whatever their name are, and, and so it's even happening, in, you see it even in the, in the States, even in New York, Israelis and, and Bahrainis and Emiratis, like we have certain groups and certain events, it's, it's remarkable and everyone is thirsty for more. Everyone wants to, you know, learn more and make connections between people. It's just a new window that opened up that I would have never ever imagined would open up in, in this way. Um, 
I, I don't even know how many family members I had uh, that even, you know, despite of COVID traveled to the UAE already, took a trip there. It's, and, and, and on the other hand, you had Bahrainis and Emiratis visiting Israel. Um, just, what, a week ago there was the Negev summit, um, Negev, the desert in the south, right? Um, the, the foreign ministers of Bahrain and UAE and Egypt and Morocco um, and, and Secretary Blinken were in Israel. For a summit that, um, I mean, it was a huge deal. It's, it's a historic deal that these Arab leaders would come to Israel. And on the other hand, some Israelis, I would say, sort of criticized the summit because it didn't do anything strong against Iran, although it's very obvious what brings all of them together. And they said um, in, in some more right-wing media in Israel that it was an American orchestrated smoke screen to bring the foreign ministers to Israel and give, some, give them something to celebrate, but it's actually a summit of the losers of, of the Iran deal. But at the same time, there's still something to celebrate about it. I mean, it's been, you can't ignore it. I mean, it's a happy thing, right? That Arab foreign leaders are uh, coming to Israel. It never happened before. It means that the Arab-Israeli, not the Palestinian-Israeli, the Arab-Israeli conflict is over and it has nothing to do with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, um, which we can touch on. <laughs> I didn't mention the Palestinians all day. Uh, we can do it in the Q&A. Um, so I'll just give you some, some big headlines, you know, uh, his, there's a, a new historic trade agreement between Israel and the UAE. The forecast is that bilateral trade in 2022 between Israel and the UAE will reach $2 billion. This is amazing. It's just the beginning, people. Um, this week, there's the Abraham Accords Games and Festival, and you have uh, a soccer match in uh, Dubai where um, soccer players from Israel's national team, Morocco's national team, Bahrain's national team will play against uh, international soccer players. I think they have, uh, what's his name, um, Kaka and Sergio, I don't know if it interests you. Anyway, but it's, <laughs> but it's amazing. Um, there was just recently a delegation of um, Emirati uh, lawmakers that came to visit the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, and they went to Yad Vashem, amazing. Um, uh, shared development of, of weapons, which is, I mean, sorry that we have to use weapons, but that's the region and it's good that we can do it together. Even Israel and, and Bahrain, uh, not, uh, Naftali Herzog, I'm saying. Uh, Naftali Bennett, he paid a historic visit to uh, the Kingdom of Bahrain. Gantz was there before him. Uh, they went to the U.S. Uh, um, naval base there. It just every shared drills, all, uh, military drills together. And I'm just taking, just name to name a few, and then I'll wrap it up. Um, even with Israel and Morocco, because we we talk a lot about Bahrain and, and the UAE, but with Morocco expects to see at least 200,000 Israelis visiting the country by the end of the year. There's a new uh, trade agreement, new tourism agreement. Um, and uh, another interesting thing is that we're seeing uh, rap rapprochement with, with Turkey happening. Uh, Herzog, the Israeli president, just went there. He spoke to Erdogan. Erdogan has been trying to make certain overtures towards Israel. Now he's playing nice um, after he called us all um, murderers and, and whatnot. Um, because of his declining economy there, the Turkish lira is whoop, and um, and the fact that he's been sort of isolated on on the world level now, he's been doing the mediation, so it appears more strong, and and he's leaning more towards the side suddenly of Israel. He went to the UAE and and Egypt, like trying to uh, play nicer to to the modern successful side of the Middle East. So I want to conclude it here, <laughs> uh, speaking about the positive things that are happening.